Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to this week's Sediments Online webinar. I'm Ola, and I'm the new addition to the moderator team. Moderator team. I'm sorry. I'm so excited. But the rest actually stays the same. So as always, we would like to thank our sponsorship from EIS, which allows us to offer all these resources free of charge. And it includes recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So please make sure to check our website. Now, today's lecture is by Dr. Domenico Chiarella. I was practicing it before who is a reader in sedimentary geology at the Royal Holloway University of London. He finished his master at the University of Calabria before moving on to the University of Basilicata for his PhD. Um, Domenico gained experience in exploration and production working for Norwegian companies. And in 2016, he rejoined academia. And right now, he's a core member of the Clastic Sedimentology Investigation uh, Group at Royal Holloway, and he's interested in marine depos depositional system at large. So with this, Domenico, I give you the mic, and I'm very excited what is, what is to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. And um, good afternoon to everyone that uh, decided to spend a couple of hours this afternoon uh, listening to my talk and to uh, where I can share my knowledge and my doubt about mixed siliciclastic carbonate deposit. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank you, uh, Sergio Longitano and Marcello Tropeano, that you see uh, here listed as a name. And uh, also, if you look at my publication on the topic, you will see that this name uh, can often back. Uh, this because more than 10 years ago, they introduced me to the mixed uh, world, let's say introduce, but basically they drop me in the field and say, look, we need to understand what's going on with this strange uh, deposit, but it was a good start. And uh, we are still continuing to work uh, on that topic. So I hope you will enjoy the, the talk. But before we go into the proper rocks, I wanted to start discussing a little bit this uh, artwork that I used here as a cover for my uh, slide. This is uh, an artwork from a Dutch artist, is uh, Escher, and the name is uh, Day and Night. As you can see, it's a very, very complex uh, picture. And I think that basically it may summarize the main aim of my talk because regardless of where you sit if you sit in the silsiclastic world or the carbonate world as if you deal with mixed deposit whatever regardless of where you start a certain point you may deal and you need to consider and uh, understand also the other component of this uh, deposit and also there is a strong link between the two components, and it's really, really important to try to understand both. So this is what I will try to show you to go together through this uh, talk. Uh, a little bit about the structure of the talk, so you have an idea more or less uh, where we are, what you expect uh, next. I will start providing you some definition and classification of mixed deposit, or some work that I've done as something that you may find in the literature. Then step a little bit aside and uh, highlight the difference between a pure siliciclastic and carbonate system, and then showing you some example of both in the out from outcrop and uh, subsurface. And then some application to reservoir. If you want to look with to reservoir and we are dealing with mixed reservoir, what should we expect? and which aspect we may consider. And then conclude with some takeaway uh, points. Uh, now, I think that if I show you something like that, I'm sure that half or pretty half of the audience will be confident with something like that because we may discuss this is okay. Is a pure siliciclastic system. Here we may have some four sets, some top set. We may discuss about the grain size, the positional processes that control the accumulation of these uh, deposits. So we can move uh, forward. The same 
for the other half of the audience, if I show you something like that, typically, first of all, the color, this yellowish color immediately tell us that we are dealing with some carbonate system. This is a Cretaceous platform from Southern Italy, it's the Apulia platforms. And we may start to discuss about which factory contribute to the building of this factory, which were the uh, climatic condition, environmental, con ecological, ecological condition of the, uh, in the water. So we may start the discussion, but what if uh, we have something different? As we know, geology not always follow uh, linear path. So we, have, we may have different components that may disturb a little bit uh, what we saw, uh, I showed you earlier. So we don't have a pure siliciclastic or a pure carbonate uh, system. And that will be the aim of the topping. When we have something like that is yellowish in color as we have the carbonate world. So because we have the carbonate uh, component, but in other sense, it works as a clastic uh, system. We recognize many uh, sedimentary structure that we may easily uh, link back to clastic system. So in the mixed, mixed system, we have the interaction between the two uh, realm and they occur when we have different proportion of both uh, component and they may occur at different scales according to the, the positional processes that's controlling the, the system, relative sea level change, climatic variation. And at the end of the day, and this has been my feeling, they provide a more sensitive record of the complex uh, and complex sedimentation pattern than the pure uh, siliciclastic or carbonate system. This is because they are able to record aspects that may pertain to one, specifically to one of these two uh, areas. Going back to definition, we need to wait until 1980 when uh, Zuffa in uh, one of his uh, seminal uh, papers defined the hybrid arenites. Hybrid arenites are arenites containing framework grains, either terrigenous or carbonates of both intrabasinal and extrabasinal origin. And we will go back to that uh, aspect because it's key for mixed uh deposit few years later mount in uh, 1984 uh, defined the mixed sediment as a sediment composed of a textual mixture of carbonate and siliciclastic uh, material let's say that after these two uh, main works and other words and then try to follow that rules there was not really any other major uh, step to try to define this uh, sediment. But in 2012 is when uh, we published the paper and saying that mixed deposit, we can consider, or at least we consider mixed deposit as a sediment containing more than 10% of the antithetic uh, component. This is because we think that when we have more than 10% is when the other components start to feel the, that there is something else in the system and it's worth to take into account and consider this aspect uh, as well. Let's say that recently in 2015, Lazar uh, et al. Uh, provide the classification for fine grain sediment. And even if they never mention mixed sediment or they don't really focus on the aspect, they provide a classification where you can easily see that when you are in the middle of this triangle, you are actually in a mixed sediment because here you feel the combination between a quartz, a siliciclastic component, and a carbon component. So if you are dealing with fine grain sediment, you may find useful to use and to go back to this uh, uh, work. As I promised you, we will go back going back to the intrabasinal and extrabasinal uh, aspect because I think this is something key uh, for mixed uh, deposit. So, mixed deposit consists of a combination of both an extrabasinal, that is typical non coeval. So, basically, the age of the grains is older compared to the age of the deposit, and an intrabasinal, so coeval 
component typically developed within uh, the basis. So we can put a boundary where we distinguish the age of the grains and the age of the deposit. And now we use in my talk this extra basinal and intra basinal or non coeval and coeval uh, terminology. So basically, we are in the middle of this tetrahedron uh, uh, composed by Zufa. So we are in a system where basically we incorporate both extra basinal and intra basinal. Uh, component. We may have different type of mixing, as I say, a different scale, but also uh, the, if we look at the component, they may be different. This is the typical case of a silsiclastic bioclastic uh, mixing, but we may have a metaclastic or bioclastic mixing when the lithoclastic component derived mainly from metamorphic uh, rocks and we saw that in some aspect the, that one may influence also the evolution of the factory and the type of the uh, deposit. And we may have also a calciclastic bioclastic uh, mix system. That when we have uh, older carbonate rocks extra basinal, so is extra basinal non coeval that is eroded and transported into the basin and mixed with the coeval intra basinal carbonate uh, uh, fraction. And uh, uh, the same kind of uh, situation that I just showed you in uh, some outcrop all the deposit we may see in present day environment. Here on the left, we have an example from the beach environment here in UK where we have a mixed uh, system. And on the right, there is a deep marine uh, picture of a system composed by the combination of the mixing between a silsiclastic and carbonate fraction. So both from beach, shallow marine to deep marine environment, even in the present day, we still uh, we are able to see such kind of uh, mixing. And if you allow me to just do diverge a little bit, the uh, digress a little bit from the topic of the talk, I may say that in these days, we have another very, very interesting mixed deposit, and it's what I call a lithoclastic plastic clastic deposit, where basically we may have a lithoclastic component, maybe silsiclastic or calciclastic, depending on the area, that is mixed with a plastic clastic uh, component. And I have said that I noticed we can learn a lot if we study mixed silsiclastic bioclastic deposit that we may apply with this new type of mixing, both on term how the different particles react to each other and interact each other and in which way the depositional processes may control uh, sediment composed by uh, such mixing. And we can go back to the outcrop composed by mixed siliciclastic bioclastic uh, system. They may represent our outcrop analog of a lithoclastic plastic plastic uh, system. But going back to the topic uh, of this talk, as I say, we may re recognize different type of mixing that can occur at different uh, scales. The first one that we defined was is a compositional mixing. So basically it's a mixing that occurs on very, very small uh, scale. Here we have one centimeter, so it occurs at the bed scale. And basically here we have the interaction of the two heterolytic fraction they are contemporaneously in time and space, resulting in lamina or beds that have a mixed siliciclastic uh, composition. Uh, typically, this type of mixing may be related to uh, itocyclic factors, like I mean, the positional processes, sensulatu, so that are acting during the sedimentation. So we may have waves, tides, currents, other processes that mix the two. Uh, component. And then when we go a larger scale, we may have what we define as the strata uh, mixing. And in that case, the two fractions are organized in interbedded siliciclastic and carbonate uh, beds. And uh, for that one, the mixing can be uh, referred to short-term climatic changes from arid to humid condition or tectonic control. Uh, in the sediment supply, so we may have an increase in the siliciclastic uh, fraction or the carbonate factor may be shut down because 
something happened in the system, or maybe related to storm activity. So occasionally we have storms that bring into the basin that normally as a specific component, a new and different type of uh, sediment. And then if we still zoom out in our system, still within the strata mixing, we may have something that is a stratigraphic scale or seismic scale uh, mixing. And this occur when we have two depositional systems of two depositional uh, elements that interact each other. In this example from the Lorca Basin for Spain, we have an alluvial siliciclastic system that in the middle interact with the more pure carbonate uh, system. And here in this type of uh, mixing, we may link back to both allocyclic and autocyclic factor that can operate together and uh, control the mixing. Uh, on top of these uh, two main uh, uh, composition and strata mixing, we may complicate a little bit the story and we may have bed scale compositional mixing. So basically we have lamina and beds that are compositional uh, mixed in composition that are part of a more larger scale, stratigraphic scale bed set packages of mixing. So we have mixed interval alternated to pure carbonate uh, intervals, or we may have, as in this case, mixed large packages, units intercalated within uh, pure siliciclastic uh, interval. In this case, the large architecture may be controlled by high amplitude orbitally driven glacial eustatic and climatic changes that control the switch on and off of the factory or other aspects that may control uh, sedimentation. Looking now in which way we can produce such different type of mixing at different uh, scale. In uh, the literature has been identified uh, some basic processes. Obviously, the story may be a little bit more complicated when we uh, go back to reality, but we may simplify uh, with few type of mixing. We may have an in situ mixing. So basically, we have a contemporaneous production and mixing of the two uh, siliciclastic and bioclastic uh, fraction. So basically the factory grow and live within the sediment. We may have a punctuated mixing. So basically we have two independent pure siliciclastic and carbonate system that occasionally like during storm condition interact. So they uh, produce a mixed system into an overlay. Uh, uh, areas and we may have a phases mixing. So when again we have two systems that are close to each other and they start to produce independently sediment, siliciclastic or carbonate that then end in an area of the basin where they uh, mix. So we have two lateral uh, pure carbonate siliciclastic dominated environment and then into the basin the final deposit will be uh, Mix. Now, uh, moving a little bit uh, out of the mixed deposit, let's see which are the main character of the two uh, single and separate components, the siliciclastic one and the carbonate uh, one. First of all, we need to look at the shape of the grains. Typically, when we have a siliciclastic deposit, the grains are, it's a quartz rich uh, deposit. So the grains that we have into our uh, deposit are well rounded to rounded. So they have a spherical uh, shape. While when we have bio, uh, bioclastic uh, rich uh, deposit, they are typically subangular class. So they have a platy to discoidal uh, shape. Uh, looking at the hydrodynamic of the different uh, type of uh, shapes that we may have in our uh, deposit, we see that it's easier to remobilize uh, plate uh, grains compared to sphere grains. So this is something that we may take into account to keep in mind when we will deal with mixed uh, sediment. 
moreover, if we look at the settling uh, velocity, so the velocity of the different component when they settle down in our basin, we may see that it's, sorry, that the coarse grains have typically uh, higher velocity, uh, settling velocity compared to the carbonates, the bioclastic uh, one. So again, if we have uh, a system composed by both components, we need to keep this additional aspect uh, in mind. Moreover, if we look at the mobility of the different uh, grains, we may say that the different particles are typically transported at different uh, levels. All of them as a bed load, but we see that for silicyclastic fractions, so they surrounded to the well-rounded one, typically the 75, almost 75% of the components are transported in saltation and 50% of the components on long step saltation. Why in bioclastic fraction that are typically, as I say, angular uh, shaped fraction, they are typically transported as a traction and short step uh, saltation. So basically, if we have all of them uh, together, they respond within the same flow as independent hydraulic sub populations. More in terms of sorting, if we consider as theoretically the best, best sorting for siliciclastic fraction as a um, zero, 0.5. In this study, Fleming uh, see that when we have uh, a mixed component, and specifically for the bioclastic fraction, there is a lag of 0 0.8. So basically, the theoretically best sort end out in to 1.3. So basically, say that the better uh, it's sorted, the better sorted the deposit, the better and higher and better sorted the final uh, deposit in case we have better and rounded uh, particles. When we have more angular and platy, and I would say maybe these are the bioclastic uh, fraction, the sorting is really a bit uh, lower. So sorting is not only a function of particle size, but also of the particle uh, shape. If we look now at the typical architecture and platform architecture of siliciclastic uh, system and uh, carbonate system, we may see that the mixed system doesn't really follow the classical model because there are major differences in the processes controlling the platform architecture as well. And just to simplify, we may say that in the terrigenous, so the clastic system, we have a sediment supply that is extra basinal, so it's coming out from outside the basin and it's controlled by the tonics, drainage system. While in the carbonate system, the sediment supply came from within the basin itself. And the main controlling component are uh, ecological, uh, ecological component like seafloor, physiography, nutrients, salinity, temperature, uh, climatic, uh, condition. So the source is different in the terrigenous and the carbonate uh, world. One is extra basinal, the other one is intra basinal. And also the sink is different because if here we have something that we typically call a source to sink system, in the carbonate world, the source is the sink. Another difference is when we look at the base level for clastic. Uh, system, we may consider the shelf equilibrium profile as controlled by the base, the, by the wave base level. So the base level is equal to the wave base uh, level. While when we look at the carbonate uh, system, we have the, the base level, it's equal to the C level. So again, there is a difference in uh, between the two system. And on top of that, as shown by this uh, Mickey Mouse uh, cartoon, through the evolution of the same system, <clears throat> when we deal with carbonate uh, deposit, we may have the different portion 
of the same system record different uh, evolution of the system itself. Here in the proximal area, for example, if we have euphotic, so organisms that uh, like to stay in the light uh, condition, so they need to have, be in an environment with a good light penetration. The factory shifted landward during a relative sea level rise because they still want to continue to be in that kind of uh, condition. So producing a landward shift, landward migration of the system. While at the same time, if we move deeper and more distally uh, in the basin, if this portion of the area is, is dominated by oligopho oligophotics, so organisms that don't really care about the uh, light conditions so the factory here uh, grow also in uh, poor light condition. We may see a shift both along the slope and uh, basin work of the factory producing a progradation of the system. So at the same time, we see in the proximal area, a uh, retrogradation in the more distal area, uh, progradation. Mm -hmm of the system. And also we may say that in carbonate system, the base level, so the sea level, so the limit controlling the position of our accumulation of our uh, factory, our deposit controlled by the factory on top of the physical accommodation that we see in a clastic system, we have an ecological uh, accommodation uh, controlled by the type, of factory, the amount of bioclast produced uh, through time, the position of the factory, because it makes a difference if the, the factory is developed more in, in the proximal area or out in the shelf or uh, a little bit deeper. And also the process is controlling the sediment uh, distribution. More, if we look at the grain size of the uh, separated of the two end member, the silsiclastic one and the carbonic one, and we see that in a silsiclastic dominated shelf, all the grain uh, fraction, grain size fraction, enter into the system from the same point. So basically at zero depth, because it's extra basin, so it's entering the basin at the same moment, all the grain size enter at the same moment. And if we put consider and put on top of the uh, hydraulic uh, curve showing that in shallower environment we have higher hydrodynamic condition and deeper environment we have uh, more quiet condition we see that this one control later the distribution of these sediments that enter all at the same uh, from the same uh, depth into the system so basically we will have classically obviously we may diverge from that one from specific case uh, but we may have typically in the shallower areas, the coarser fragment and going deeper and deeper, we go from uh, coarser to finer. So the grain size distribution is mainly controlled, controlled by the depositional, uh, sedimentary depositional uh, processes. This is not exactly uh, the same as work for carbonate system, where, as we said, the source of the sediment is intrabasinal. So basically can, occur in any place here along the shelf and then distributed both landward and uh, basinward. And also the grain size is controlled by the ecological process. So we may have euphotic, oligophotic or aphotic uh, factories related to the light penetration of the light into the system. So again, where is the fraction? And the typical grain size of the fraction is not controlled by the uh, depositional processes, sedimentary depositional process, but we have ecological uh, processes. Now, if we try to build and merge together the type of platform that we have with the grain size, so that enter into the system and the distribution, typical distribution of, this, of the grain size, this is the typical system that we see in silsiclastic uh, systems. So we may have a short phase, more or less uh, inclined with the system that progress. As I said, all the sediment enter from outside the basin at the same, all the grain size enter uh, the same moment in the, uh, from the same point into the basin and then they are distributed uh, along our uh, profile. 
if we now look what's happening with the carbonate uh, system, and here the red line, it's the one copied from the siliciclastic profile. We may say that, for example, in this case, the uh, the hydraulic sorry the uh, curve describing the hydrodynamic of the system is the same for all that system because basically we have the base level is positioned in the same way. But since here we have an oligophotic uh, fraction, oligophotic factory, sorry, producing a carbonate fraction that is positioned uh, here, not necessarily we have the coarser material in the proximal area and the finer one in the distal area. So actually we may have the opposite. So we may have the finer material in the more shallower and proximal area and became coarser and coarser in the deeper uh, area. Different, and in this case, we have a ramp. This is our profile for our carbonate system. While if we have like a, rimmed, a reef rimmed uh, platform, obviously here the arrow indicates the position of the factory and the building capacity of the carbonate system, we still see that this one differs from the typical profile produced by a uh, siliciclastic uh, system. In this case, we have an ophotic factory that grow uh, here. And again, from that point, we can start to distribute the carbonate fraction, both basin work and uh, uh, land work. More if we have a mixed uh, system, tectonic make activity may control the evolution of the different system. And this is a case uh, published a few years ago in a compression system. So here we have trust that were active during the position. And we see that depending on the uh, activity of the trust, we may alternate moments uh, characterized by the development of a pure carbonate system. So we have a, a carbonate factory. This because in that moment, the ecological condition of the correct, the perfect one for the factory to grow in that position. But when the trust uh, is active and the carbon may be, the platform may be exposed or go into ecological condition that are not the best one for the factory to continue to grow, we may start to have erosion of this uh, system producing bioclast that then can then uh, be mixed with the siliciclastic fracture and producing a mixed uh, deposit. And then this kind of alternation can go, uh, we can have through time. So at the end, we may have more pure class, uh, carbonate system, pure siliciclastic one and mixed system intercalated among. Uh, them. So what's the lesson learned so far? Looking at the diff what's the difference between in shape, sorting, settling, uh, hydrodynamics, platform, evolution of the different uh, siliciclastic, pure siliciclastic and carbonate system is that the physical uh, stratigraphic concept applied to siliciclastic system not necessarily work in the carbonate one. So when we deal with the deal with the uh, mixed siliciclastic carbonate uh, system, we need to be a little bit more careful and enter into the carbonate area and understand the factory because from the factory we may learn a lot and get a lot of information that may be useful for our uh, interpretation. So what if we have a mixed system? It can be at uh, composition mixing at the bed scale, or we may have different types of mixing and beds that uh, are alternated in uh, time. Should we use, which is our model that we need to use, which is our reference? The classic one, the, we use typically short phase with that kind of process, or we need to look more for a carbonate uh, ramp and everything that pertains to this kind of system that has been described in the literature. Are the sedimentary processes important? So the one controlling the, the end of the day, the system, or is the biota that uh, say uh, the truth? The, the answer is that both are important. So both sedimentary processes, because they control the distribution uh, to a certain extent 
of the system and the biota. But the point is that we need to be able to integrate each other and try to learn what both uh, aspects uh, can tell us. So let's go now quickly through some outcrop and uh, subsurface example of a mixed system and see how they may differ and uh, how they may work. Here we have a shallow marine system. It's uh, something we're studying in southern Italy. We are in the front of the uh, Apennine. And in this case here, we have an in situ mixing. So basically the factory grow and develop within the sediment into the, in the basin. And at the end, we will have a compositional uh, mixing. Here we are in the shallow marine areas. So the system is dominated by 3D, sorry, by wave in the more shallow areas. And then moving a little bit deeper, we have, we feel the influence of tidal uh, current. The interaction of all these uh, depositional processes with the position here, the arrows again, give us an idea of where was localized mainly the factory during the deposition may produce specific uh, sedimentary uh, structure. In this case, this was a mud free uh, environment helped us to recognize this tidal signal within this uh, signature, within this mixed uh, siliciclastic bioclastic uh, deposit, because basically at the end, going to the back group, you recognize that there are uh, um, intervals, laminar sets composed mostly by siliciclastic uh, fraction, alternated with thinner laminar composed by a uh, bioclastic uh, fraction. In that case, we can say that the bioclastic fraction mimic and replace what in the typical tidal system is uh, the role of the mud. So here, the bioclast drape work as a mud drape, uh, drape the siliciclastic fraction, so work as a mud drape in the classic uh, sandy mud uh, system. And here we were able also to identify the tidal bundles and also to recognize almost nearly complete tidal signal with the nip and spring uh, cycle. So here understanding the role of the bioclastic fraction and how that one was interacting with the siliciclastic one was useful for us to uh, finally interpret and propose an interpretation for the main depositional process controlling uh, the system. Still in uh, Southern Italy, but now we are in a slightly different uh, areas. We are in the Matera High. The deposit here in the lower part are Cretaceous uh, carbonate. So this is the Apulia uh, platform. And here in this case, we have an uh, oligophotic uh, factories. Uh, that is positioned almost here. So it's in the offshore uh, areas of our uh, system. So the building capacity is mainly here. And through a relative sea level rise, so we have a transgression, we see here we can produce a series of onlap on that system. And we don't really see any wave uh, controlled deposit or any shallower deposit, but it's because the main factory uh, was deposited here and also the uh, all the sediment so in this case the calciclastic sediment produced derived from this cretaceous uh, carbonate was just shed into this distal uh, portion so at the end we have this sort of onlaps on top of the bedrocks but in the same area so we are still in the matera high just in a slightly different position of our system where we have more an euphotic factory uh, developing in the system. So before it was an oligophotic, here is an euphotic. We see that along the same type of system, so the bedrock is still the same Cretaceous uh, deposit of the Apulia platform and the, mi and the mixture is still composed by it. the mixture between the calciclastic uh, Cretaceous deposit and the uh, bioclastic uh, fracture. We still have a compositional mixing, but the architecture of the deposit is different. Here we have these sort of clinoforms. They start to progress 
and develop. This is because the position of the euphotic uh, factory, it's more shallower. This was in the stage uh, one, in stage two. So here we have that the both uh, silsiclastic and uh, bioclastic fraction enter or are in the system exactly the same uh, point, and then they start to distribute and build some sort of a, uh, clinoform. Moving a little bit uh, deeper, recently there's been a paper published in uh, Basic Research, and here in this deep marine uh, system, we have the previous one were all in situ mixing, so we have the carbon factory within the sediment. Here we have a case of phases uh, mixing, producing both a compositional and strata mixing. Looking here at one example of the deposit, we have an alternation of a pure low density uh, turbidites, and in the middle we have a mixed, uh, a bed composed of a mixed uh, siliciclastic and carbonate uh, system. Here an example how potentially were the two uh, pure uh, system positioned with a more pure clastic, siliciclastic system and a carbonate one that in the distal portion of the basin start to interact producing a mixed uh, deposit. Looking at the sea rift uh, situation, here we have a rotated fault blocks. Typically, the crest here of the football is the best place for a photic uh, factory to grow. So here may, we may have a reef uh, rim, and that rim may produce and uh, interact with the pure silsiclastic system coming from the other margin of the rotated flow blocks. And here in the middle, we may have a situation where we have both a composition of strata uh, mixing. So when we deal in seismic and we have a situation like that, and we think that there were the, correct, the right condition to have a carbonate factory uh, in that position, moving a little bit away from the crest of the uh, rotated flow blocks, we, may, we should expect to have a mixed deposit in that uh, position. More looking at shelf age uh, system, again, this is the best place to have a, a reef. And this reef may work as a barrier. So basically, this reef may stop silsiclastic system to enter the basinal area. So basically, we have some sort of uh, starvation into the deeper uh, areas of our system. And if we look through an example where we see, we recognize that there's been the reef, the clastic system coming from the main, from the shelf was interacting with the reef, then the reef was still able to grow. So basically in this lower portion, we should expect that we have condensation into the, sorry, starvation into the basin with no really clastic sediment able to reach this uh, portion of the basin. While when the reef is overwhelmed by the clastic system, the clastic system starts to shut or die the reef system, we may start to have more and more deposit accumulated on the other side of the, uh, in the, in the slope, on the, along the slope in the basin area until a certain point, the clastic system dominate and we have a progradation, a gradation and progradation of the system. So around this area in the lower part here, we may have mixed deposit because we have in the, the interaction of the, from between the clastic system and the carbon one. And also in this moment, when we start to erode and destroy this reef, we may still produce uh, mixed uh, system. Recently, Moscardelli and uh, Etali uh, published a paper where they also uh, look at the system producing composition and uh, strata mixing from Nova Scotia. And basically looking at this uh, area from shelf to the slope to the basin, they did a series of transects, different section across uh, the data and looking at moving along the shelf they recognize the area where we have the massive development of the carbonate uh, factory. And again, the clastic system 
is entrapped, it's stopped here, so it's not able to reach the slope and the basin, and here we have a mixed uh, deposit. But while we will have area where the reef is less developed or is not present, where the clastic system may, are able to reach the basin. So here is clearly how the interaction between the siliciclastic and the carbonate uh, rail may control where you may find the deposit, in this case was the best reservoir, or uh, what type of sediment aspect, if they are mixed or pure clastic or pure carbonate, or mixed again here into the basin. So there is a control also in the different budget that we may have into the system. And looking at the present day mixed system, these data are from Puerto Rico. Again, this is just one case studies. We may uh, see something different when we apply to our uh, situation. Here we may say that we have 100% of the sediments coming from the extra outside from the basin, so it's an extra basin uh, source. And typically 60% of this sediment is uh, stored in the shelf and 40% of that sediment is uh, remobilized and, and moved outside of the shelf, so in the slope and into the um, basin. But when we look at the carbonate uh, budget, so it is almost 100% produced within the, the shelf, we see that it's stored, so it remained there, so it's not uh, remobilized and uh, relocated outside. So along the shelf, we have the best condition to have a mix of siliciclastic carbonate uh, system. These two last points that I mentioned may have an impact also when we look from a sequence study graphic point of view to mix a uh, siliciclastic uh, carbonate system. Because if typically, and again, I stress typically, maybe not the case for every situation, we have a low stand dominated by siliciclastic deposits and, and a high stand dominated by uh, carbonate uh, deposit. If the shelf age is dominated by carbon, so we have a, a reef growing here that can act as a barrier for the transfer of the clastic system from the shelf into the basin, we may have in the basin the situation mix the system is slightly different. So the low stand, we have starvation, we have no sediment almost reaching the basin. We may have an increase during transgression when we start to raise the relative sea level and we may start to destroy this uh, barrier. So all the sediment that was accumulated here start to be, uh, we have another production in that moment. So all the sediment is remobilized along the slope, slope and the basin. And then we have again back to the ice stand that is dominated by the carbonate uh, system. So we see how, when we look at mixed system, even from a sequence study point of view, we should be careful to consider both uh, component. Back to some studies that we have done, we have here in, uh, we are back to Southern Italy. We are just along the uh, trust uh, front of the Apennines. Here we have in a very tectonic active areas controlled by trust and uh, backstrust. In this case, the trust and backstrust control the physiography of the basin. ACA control the ecological condition, control the circulation of the current, and at the end of the day, control, they may control the position of the carbonate uh, factories. And here, if in this area we do three different uh, sections, one here, look at the scale. We have just a few kilometers apart, the different section in the Acerenza, La Guardia, and uh, sorry, Acerenza, La Guardia, and uh, Madonna di Pompei uh, section. We see that depending on where we are, we may see a gradation, progradation, or progradation, and uh, dust stepping. This is because when we have a ratio between the siliciclastic and the carbonate fraction uh, lower, uh, lower than, than one, so we have a large carbonate production, we may see that the system start to prograde because we have a lot of sediment into the system. While when we are in an area where actually we don't really have 
a large factory, a carbonate factory developed in the area, or because, again, the ecological condition and circulation are not the best one for the factory to uh, develop, we mainly see an aggradation. So the classic source to sink concept doesn't really work on mixed uh, system. And we may see an a long strike variabilities, either because the tectonic activities may control where the carbonate, uh, where are the best conditions, the best situation for the carbonate factory to grow. And then the in situ fracturing may play a role in controlling the final distribution and the final architecture that we may have in our uh, system. So if we are in that case, what's the correct uh, interpretation? Is it an aggrading system, prograding system? So what's the correct interpretation? Actually, probably all of them are correct. This is because the description are correct, but just when we move into the interpretation, we need to combine all the information and remove the background noise produced either by the carbonate uh, fraction or the silicy casting fraction, depending if we, where we are positioned, if we came more from the clastic world or if we came more from the carbonate uh, world. And I personally came from the clastic world, so I need to learn uh, from the carbonate world how to implement and improve my uh, uh, interpretation. Trying to go in towards the conclusion and see how, when we have mixed the deposit, how they may affect our reservoir and what kind of implication they may have. Going back to the example that I showed you earlier, where we recognize this carbonate rich uh, lamina of forest that we recognize in our uh, deposit, they basically compartmentalize the reservoir. So basically they may act as a buffer or as a barrier for the migration of the, uh, of the fluid, then controlling the overall uh, permeability. And in this case, we may see that an horizontal permeability is a uh, permeability is higher than the vertical uh, permeability because again these carbonate layers act as a uh, barrier or even when we go a larger scale so not the composition but the strata uh, mixing we may end with a very very sharp transition between carbonate rich and silicyclastic rich uh, zone that may end with more permeable so reservoir prone or cemented, no reservoir prone uh, interval. And finally, when we deal with mixed deposit, like that one here, the lower part, the, uh, the lower part is a carbonate uh, interval, the upper part is a more uh, silicyclastic uh, one. Would be interesting to have a look in, in which way the trace forces interact and integrate and merge the two components where we may end that uh, silicyclastic fraction enter and is distributed, redistributed into the carbonate uh, interval. Finally, when we look at the petrophysical properties of this uh, mixed system, given all the differences that we have highlighted and in which the way that may combine, we may simplify that typically velocity in carbonates is controlled by porosity and for types, while in CC clastic rocks is controlled by porosity, but also mineralogy and uh, overburden uh, pressure. While if we are in a mixed CC clastic carbonate uh, system, this controlling factor compete each other, ending <clears throat> with something that is not so easy to discriminate which interval, which portion of our system uh, retain have the better reservoir. Uh, property. So, so far, what we have, at least from my understanding, is that we have more question than uh, answer. That is good because basically we have a lot to understand, a lot to study, and more to implement and to learn each other from both the clastic and the carbonate uh, world. Trying to summarize and to conclude some takeaway points the, we may consider it, is that silicy clastic and carbonate sedimentation interact, producing the positional regime that departs, diverges a little bit from the classic one composed by pure silicy clastic and carbonate uh, system. 
everything that we know and works for the silsiclastic and carbonate deposits not always work when we deal in a mixed system. And I say that one again from someone coming from a clastic uh, world, but I assume it's the same from people coming from the carbonate world, world when they need to deal with this mixed uh, system. So mixed systems are really, really complex. And as in many other uh, situation and system, it's not easy uh, to understand. It's not fully uh, understood. And the only suggestion that I think may share with you and to take what uh, postulated by Norma Ketali in 1993, when we deal with mixed deposits, with mixed uh, sediment, to try to do a phase analysis without any model in mind, without any model coming from the classic world or the carbonated world, and to try to fit it to our uh, system. So basically try to do description, observation with the brain uh, switched off. Uh, finally, just to conclude uh, with something uh, easier, I took that one from my colleague Javier Hernandez Molina, showed with me the first time and I think really, really works for that talk uh, as well. In this case, the comics is uh, maybe British, our British colleagues may recognize it. We have a gentleman here looking for the quarter and the policeman approached him and say, what are you doing, sir? So I'm looking for my quarter. Did you drop here? No, I dropped it uh, two blocks uh, away from here down street. So why are they looking here? Because the light is better here. And this is the risk, what we may risk to do when we work with mixed deposit, but also in other situation as well, to try to apply a model that we know is working, we are familiar with, but mainly and only because we are confident with that model, we are confident with that system and try to force uh, to our mixed uh, system. So all models are wrong, but they may be useful to help us to understand our uh, deposit. Here I have copied just uh, some of the papers I've published, but there are many, many others, and you may go back to my papers just for the reference, not for the paper itself, but for have you to have you for the record, some of the paper you may find interesting to have a look uh, to deal with mixed deposit. And also I would like to use this occasion to advertise a PhD, posi PhD position I have in uh, this is my department working with me and the CSI group. It's a four year PhD opportunity. It's part of the NERC uh, GeoNet Zero CDT, CDT. And unfortunately, it's open only to UK and EU students. So sorry for our overseas uh, colleague. The official application closed the 1st of February 2021, but there will be a pre selection. So please, if you are interested, if you are in UK and a EU student, you are interested, contact me, uh, drop me an email and we can uh, discuss uh, about that. So I think we are open for questions and thank you for having me here today. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Domenico, very much for this not only insightful, but actually also very, very entertaining uh, presentation. And just before we will come to the questions and I will read them aloud, if I didn't have my PhD, I would totally, totally apply for working with you. So dear audience, please, if you have, if you know some, some good candidates, just please feel free to advertise this position. All right, so we have the question from um, John from Dahran. I hope I read it properly. Shouldn't we make a distinction between cool water carbonates and tropical carbonates mixing with plastics? That's the first question. And just, yeah, there is a second part of the question, but maybe I will just, yeah. Yeah, uh, let's say yes. Let's say that by definition, we, sh we should expect, and this is what I started, that cool water carbonate are typically more prone to, um, to mix that system because typically they are oligophotic, so they don't really care about light conditions. So they uh, 
uh, adapt better to mixed condition. But I have to say that, and uh, I'm actually just in the moment studying, uh, trying to go back to the literature to look at that. There are many, many, many examples of tropical uh, factory interacting with plastic uh, system as well. So we have mixed system where the carbon factory is a tropical one. So it's good to distinguish. There are obviously differences between the two, but we may have mixed system even dealing with tropical uh, factories. This is my understanding. And the second part of the question, how do we deal with point source silicic plastics and line source carbonates, tropical? As I say, this is maybe a case of a phaseous mixing. So obviously we have two separate uh, input to separate source, but this doesn't mean that in some place in the basin because the wave car, the wave action of current, long short current, or just because as in the uh, deep water system I showed you, they end uh, all of them into the basin. So maybe originally we don't have a compositional mixing into the shallow water areas, but in more distal, more deeper area, they may interact ending with the, let's say more passive. If the first one is a more active mixing, the second one may be a more a passive mixing because we have the two uh, fact, the two components that interact. So it's a more phaseous mixing than an in situ mixing, going back to the depositional the process controlling the mixture. And the next question is from Jaco Bass. I'm sorry, Jaco, I can't remember where you're based. Please don't forget to write where you're watching us from. The question is how could we include fine grade cohesive, cohesive sediment in the analysis of mixed systems? And yes, Jaco is writing from Banyar University in Wales. Thank you. So thank you, Jacob. And I think here you can uh, provide me more information and answer, then I can come back to you because you are more expert than me uh, in that kind of a uh, process. But sure, if we have uh, clay, ch like clay chips or mud chips that uh, have, we need to consider which is the difference in terms of shapes, density, and in which way in our flow, in our uh, process, the two particles interact each other. I show you this example from Flemings, but I think this is, for example, one of the aspects where we need to work a little bit more to reproduce, to run flume experiment and see when we have such type of interaction between CC clastic and bioclastic with uh, mud class, cohesive mud class as well, or with silicic clastic and plastic as well. So every time we have component that may have a difference in shape, uh, roundness, uh, sorry, in shape, um, in density. So basically the behavior in the flow is different. We need to look and see in which way they may uh, interact. So I, I, I don't have a fully answer, but I think this is definitely an area where uh, there is a lot of things to be done. The next question comes from Stephen. I again don't know where he is he watching us from. Do you know whether numerical models do a decent job at simulating these sorts of systems? Mm, sorry, I not that I know. I'm I don't know any model. Maybe they exist. It's just my lack of knowledge on that aspect. So, uh, so but probably yes. Since the numerical model may be used to simulate other type of processes, definitely why not? It's something it's possible to try. Okay, the, the next one is long and it's a praise from Domenico from, no, uh, I'm sorry, not from Domenico, from Valentin from um, Oslo in Norway. Hey Domenico, great talk and amazing t-shirt. I admit yeah. I'm only right now notice which t-shirt <laughs> you're actually wearing, it is amazing. My question to you is, in the picture showing a long strike variation with siliciclastic dominated zones next to carbonate drift dominated zones that trapped the sediments, do you think A, that the position of the reefs dedicate, 
dictated, sorry, where the clastic sediments could be transported to deeper waters. Yes. Or B, okay. <laughs> okay, oh, B, like, let's, say, let's say maybe something else. I, yeah. Let's, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Let's go with the B. I will, I will read the question till the end, already knowing the answer. Or B, that the entrance points of the clastic system dictates where you could build the reefs and hence where the deep water system will develop. Okay, let's say maybe a little bit more complex than just a yes or no. I think it depends, first of all, of the type of factory that you have, because if it's a, a cool water, so an oligophotic factory, they don't really care if there is a clastic input. So basically the position of the factory of the potential uh, reef is not really influenced and controlled by the clastic input. So in that case, is the reef is not controlling is not controlled by the sediment input. But on the other side, if we have an euphotic factory, in that case, yes, maybe the reef will just be positioned on the side compared to the main entry point, because in that areas, there is less um, turbidity in the water, there is more light penetration, so it's the best place. At the end of the day, we need to think, and this is another amazing thing that, you know, back 10 years ago, I realized that, the carbonate fraction is alive, while the clastic fraction, you know, it's something we just transport around. The carbonate one is alive, so they can move, they can readapt, they can move to a different place. So if there is a place where there is a strong carb uh, clastic input, and it's not the best place for them, there's not the best area to grow, definitely the reef will grow uh, lightly. So both A and B may be correct, but at the end of the day, you need depend of which type of carbonate factory you you have in your system. Um, Zane from Colorado School of Mines says, great job, Domenico, very interesting talk. I, like Jaco, am interested in how mud, carbonate or plastic may affect the positional processes and thus architecture. Uh, as I say, let's say that for example, if we have a mud dominated system, we may exclude that we have an aeophotic uh, factory. So we will have with the uh, oligophotic factory. And another aspect that maybe I didn't stress uh, enough in my talk is that if the grain size is controlled by the depositional processes in the classic system, we don't really have the same control in the carbon one because there are factory that by nature produce a coarser or final fraction. So the fraction that we may have coming from the carbonate uh, fraction not necessarily reflect the position we are in, in the profile. So saying that the 40 factory, I shouldn't expect to have a 40 factory if we have a lot of mud into the system. So we are moving more into the oligophotic mm -hmm. factor and say that it may be different if we have bryozoa, bivalves, echinoderms, or other type of uh, green, uh, red algae. The grain size that we deal, this may interact again with the mud. So I don't really have the answer, but mainly because I never run any experiment or look in which way the mud may interact with that one. Definitely the mud has an impact on the type of carbonate factory that we develop, for sure there will be an impact into the flow if in our flow we have a mud uh, fraction as well, but I don't have the answer right now. So maybe it's something where we need to look. Um, Domenico, there are more um, thanks for you and praises. And there is a comment about numerical models, ask Peter Burgess. Uh, and now I will just move to another question from Hanif, writing from Malaysia. There seems to be some distinctive vegetation pattern from the outcrop examples that you show. Is there a correlative trend? Maybe vegetation prefer one type of system than the other. It's not, sorry, maybe it's just a confusion. It's not a vegetation in terms of vegetation as we may assume was just a graphic representation to have uh, there a different type of uh, carbonate uh, factory into the system so I, I never 
as a look at the where the vegetation may grow, I only look at the carbon factory itself. So that one is not really a vegetation, sort of vegetation. It's mainly be confusing just the way I draw. <laughs> yeah, I draw. And the, the second question from Hanif is, even if the content of sediments inside are different in mixed systems, are we still able to see a BOMA sequence pattern in terms of grain size in deep water mixed turbidite systems? Now we are going a little bit far already into the BOMA sequence. So I don't know, but I should not expect to have the same, mainly because we don't necessarily have all the grain size available in our uh, flow. The composition of the flow may be different. As I show you from this work done by Fleming, but again, there may be additional work that may be done, look like the two fraction uh, stay in different position within the flow. So at the end, we may have a more comp composite and different uh, internal architecture compared to what we have in the classic Bauma Sigma. So I expect to have something different, but again, I have no proof, so I don't have any data to support my, it's just my gut feeling. <laughs> um, Marcello from Bremen is saying, Ciao Domenico, thanks for the great talk. I always wondered why are these mixed deposits so often sand dominated? In the mud, is the mud exported somewhere else? Would high turbidity due to much shut off the carbonate factory? For the second part of the question, so if the high turbidity shut off the carbon, yes, if we have euphotic uh, fractions. And uh, maybe it's because the example that I show you are shallow marine examples. So basically, typically the, the mud is uh, moved away uh, from the areas. We have to say also that there are uh, situations where we, because this is another aspect that we realized that we di very difficult found the carbonate mud into the system itself. This because maybe it is dissolved into the system, there is less preservation. So we don't really, really uh, have uh, that component into the system. Uh, Back to the Marcello question, it's not, it's sand dominated, but we need to consider also that we have large uh, gravel because most or some of the bioclass components may be in the gravel uh, side, maybe granules or, or small pebbles, especially if we are in a shallow water condition. So yes, the mud is a, may have an impact to shut down the carbon factory. So if we have mud, we typically, and we are in the condition to have an euphotic factory, we don't have the mixer because there is no room for the euphotic fraction to develop. But on the other side, I don't really think that the mud is the controlling system because we may have situation where the factory don't really care if there is mud around or not. I hope I can read it properly. Zarek from Alexandria asks, do you think that there are some clay minerals more prone to be present in the mixed environment compared to the siliciclastic environment? Thank you for this great talk. Uh, some clay I'm prone to mix and compare. Uh, sorry, I, I, I never moved into that uh, aspect, so I don't know, uh, but Flipping the questions, what we think is that when we deal with the deposit, mixed deposit, where the lithoclastic fraction is dominated by metamorphic deposits, so it, they are more prone to produce uh, mud uh, fractions, this may control the type of factory that we may have. So I have no idea about the in which way the clay minerals may be uh, more prone to be present in mixed environment to silicic, to sorry to mix environment in mixed environment compared to silicate one, but definitely I think that the type of mud may control the type of factory, so the type of mixed deposit we may have at the end. 
um, Benjamin from Texas is asking about any thoughts on hybrid event bets. Oh, sorry. Um, a paper by Eric Kvala, 2020, on the Wolf conformation in the US Permian Basin invokes mixed composition hybrid event beds. The deposits record clastic carbonates transitioning upward into silica rich mudstones. This seems like a different mixing situation than you've described. Personally, I suspect much of the silica is biogenic and pelagic, pelagic or hemipelagic and maybe not a true hybrid event. Uh, I can say, and I think there is nothing wrong to say that if I remember correctly, I think I reviewed it, but I was one of the reviewers of this uh, Eric Valle paper last year. Uh, uh, so I haven't used in my presentation either because I tried to stay, I even, not sure if it's been published or not. So sorry for that. Maybe it's like my no. So I know the paper because I reviewed it. Uh, I didn't use because it's not something I personally studied, I personally covered in my topic. And so I don't really know the situation to see if these uh, uh, pelagic, uh, so if this uh, silica fraction is more pelagic or is part of the same. Uh, mixed system. So we should go back in the field and see what is the real uh, component of this uh, stuff. But this definitely, if, uh, uh, as I said before, if we are in a mixed system, maybe we need to diverge a little bit from this hybrid event, but as a classically, classically defined for plastic, pure plastic system, because the behavior of the carbon components may be slightly different. And also, and by here we, are back, we go back to maybe a different topic. If any of you follow the um, webinars run by the Society of Economic and Petroleum Mineralogists about hybrid event was a few weeks ago, last week, we may end how much of the upper part of the hybrid event is really part of the flow or it's uh, pelagic uh, deposit. So how much of the upper portion of the hybrid event is part of the hybrid event or is part of a two separate, uh, of a separate uh, component. So I think we can go back to this question to the, even to the pure hybrid uh, beds to the, try to discriminate. And then when we ask, well, answer that question, we may try to think in which way, if we have a mixed component, that one behave in our uh, flow. So sorry, again, I don't really have uh, <laughs> a final question, a pro proper question to answer you, but I know the paper, I know the situation that they describe, and I know that they don't consider as a pelagic one, but they consider as part of the mixed system. And, you know, reading the paper, I need to uh, take us through what they say and uh, but obviously to have a proper and personal opinion we need to go back to the field and look at the whole picture rather than just what's presented next question comes from sangeeta from india and i have to say i can identify myself with this question very much what about interaction between freshwater carbonates and silsiclastic I'm interested in knowing what factors are responsible for mixed sediments deposits in continental setting. Yay, that's a uh, question. I, I never, <laughs> I, sorry, as I say, I, if you remember one of the last slides of my talk is that I have more questions than answers. So maybe this is why I'm reflecting in this kind of QA session, but thanks for all these uh, wonderful, a really, really interesting question. I never uh, studied uh, freshwater uh, carbonate in which way they may interact. I have to say that just thinking loudly now with you, I may think that we can take all the basic assumption valid for freshwater as well. So we need to consider in which way uh, ecological, ecological parameters may control the evolution of the system, in which way they may control the presence of mud, may shut, uh, shut off and uh, 
kill the carbonate factor and we need to take a look and come into consideration of the different grain size uh, shapes of the fraction. So from terms of the positional processes, I think all of them are valid. But if there is any specific and particular component that diverge the marine environment for the freshwater one, it's something that uh, I don't think at the moment, but maybe looking a little bit more deeper. As I say, I'm not a carbonate sedimentologist, so I may fail to know everything about the role and how the carbonate component uh, deal in the different uh, environments. So I, I would say there are no differences, but maybe it's good to worth to have a look a little bit closer to to see if it is. So sorry. <laughs> okay. In this case, I see that there are just more thanks to you, but no more questions. So in this case, Domenico, thank you very much again for this inspiring talk. And to all of you watching us, next week's seminar is going to be at the regular time at 4 p.m. And Hilary Corlett will be talking about hyperspectral imaging in sedimentary rocks at core and outcrop scale. Please join us and then, yeah, see you then. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs>